In. If you're going through something today, don't look how big your problem is, look how big your God is, amen? Because He's greater. Praise the Lord for the worship time. As you know, Brother Joe has finished up the uh, Pastors, Belize Pastors Conference this weekend, so I'm sure he'll give uh, a report on that and uh, be letting you know how all that went. We praise the Lord that uh, our church is able to do ministry like that. Well, there was a mother in the kitchen, and she was looking through the little kitchen opening at her little four-year-old playing in the living room. And the four-year-old was playing with the cat, and the four-year-old little Johnny had his dad's Bible open and preaching to the cat. And so the mom walked in there and said, Little Johnny, what, what are you doing? And said, Well, me and the cat are playing church. And said, Well, that's nice. About five minutes later, you hear this blood-curdling screaming coming from the cat. And man, the mom dropped her dishes, ran, tried to find out in the house where this screaming cat was coming and she heard it in the bathroom so she opened the bathroom door and sure enough there was little Johnny with the cat in the tub all wet and said Johnny what are you doing he said I'm baptizing the cat <laughs> so Johnny you don't understand cats are deathly afraid of water little Johnny said well he should have thought about that before he joined my church So, before you answer the question, are you right with God this morning? Maybe you need to think about something. And what is that? Well, it's something that we all need to think about. It's a question we should ask ourselves, and that is, how's your spiritual appetite? How is your spiritual, and now we're not talking about physical appetite, we're talking about how is your, that usually all stays pretty good most of the time, but how is your spiritual appetite? appetite this morning. We want to look over a few verses in the scripture that give this very analogy of looking at spiritual appetite, I believe symbolically with our physical appetite, which we're well versed with. We know it quite well. We've had it since we've been born, so we can easily know what appetite means. So when we tack on spiritual appetite, we pretty much get the message. So let's look at some verses this morning, I believe, that'll speak to our heart because this is a key question we need to ask ourselves all the time. All the time. No matter how long we've been saved. How's my spiritual appetite? So let's look at the first one. Spiritual appetite is a first step toward a relationship with God. Psalm says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste Him and see for yourself. You know, isn't that the phrase we do when we've we have a meal that's our favorite, you know, a snack that's our favorite, you know, and we'll say, we'll say to somebody, here, take a bite, uh, taste this and see what you think, you know, just take a little, little taste and uh, because it's good to me and it's, it ought to be good to you. You know, you get two responses, man, you're right, and the person says, give me a, give me a meal of that. Or you got people that said, nah, it doesn't quite hit my taste buds the way it does yours and you can go ahead and keep it. There's nothing wrong to tasting in the Lord. Tasting's not eating, though. Eating is salvation. Tasting's okay when you're first trying to come to the Lord and you're reading the Word and you're hearing messages. It's, it's all right to taste. That's how you end up eating, is taking a taste test. Well, that's what the psalmist says here. If you will taste the Lord, you're going to find out once you eat Him, in, in the spiritual sense, He's good. The Lord is good. The only way you're going to know that is to taste and eat. And you'll find out real quickly. You know, a lot of people like to use this verse that we're about to look at to make this proof that you can use, lose your salvation. This is immediately what they'll go to when somebody says, hey, you can get saved and lose it. Well, they, unfortunately, they haven't really done any deep study into this or they'd find out it doesn't teach that. You say, well, what does it teach? Well, let's look at it. For in the case of those who've been enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gift and been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they have again crucified to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame." So what is this talking about? Well, first of all, let's look at the word enlightened. 
photizo, which you can see where we get our word photo. You can see the word photo in there. It means to give light by knowledge. Its basic meaning is to just, is to just be mentally aware of something and know about something. Nowhere in Scripture does it call Christians the enlightened ones or the enlightened. Nowhere. And, it, and so the people grab this and say, there you go, there's Christians. No, it's not. Christians are not referred to. Now, we are enlightened. I mean, that's how we start out. But we're never referred to once we are Christians as the enlightened ones are enlightened. So these people in this book, they, they have been enlightened. They've, they've got... Uh, the Word, they've, they've made the Word's been shown to them. They've got the light of the Word. People shared the Word with them. They have all kind of knowledge about Jesus. A lot of people in this world, you say, do you know Jesus? Oh, yeah, I know about Jesus. You know church? Oh, they know Scripture. They know about the Bible. They know about prayer. They know who Jesus is. But that don't mean that they're Christians. They've just been enlightened. They've got the facts. They're aware of it. And we don't mean do you know Him that way. We know, we mean you know him on a personal way. And then the word is partakers, partakers. And this word means not to possess something, but to be associated with something. It's not partaking, meaning I've got it in here. It means I'm associated with something. A lot of people say, hey, Brother Tim, do you know this person or this famous person? It's like, yeah, I know him. Well, what I mean is I'm associated with them. I've read about them, I, but they, don't, they wouldn't know my name if you mentioned it to them. But I'm associated with them. I, I've seen them. I've met them maybe. I, I've talked with them, but they don't really know me. I, I, I really, I'm just associated. I, it's not a possessing. To have Christ is a possessing. These people just knew about him, maybe kind of hanging around the perimeters, but nothing much. And then the word is used twice, not once, but twice, that they tasted and they tasted. They didn't eat, which is symbolic of salvation, but they took a bite of Jesus. They were in a church service. Matter of fact, these people had more than we had. They had the apostles preaching to them directly. They were seeing miracles that the apostle was doing, or apostles were doing directly. We didn't even have that. You just have the Word, which is not just the Word. You have the Word. You have people up here preaching. But they had the miracles being done right in front of them to add more significance, so to speak, to them. But after all the facts were in, hearing all about Jesus, hearing all about the death on the cross, and taking the little taste test during a church service, during reading the Bible, and said, okay, let me take a little taste test. Don't want it. Sounded good. Heard all the facts. And I took my little taste in a church service, or when you preached, Nope, that's not for me, that's for you. And they walked away. What more can be done? They've already seen the miracle, seen the Word, heard the Word, and now they're just going to walk away from it. And the verse there says, you know, it's impossible to renew them to repentance again. They've had all, everything right there, the full disclosure, the full Revelation, and then to come up with a conclusion, no. And you see what it says? It says that they crucified to themselves the Son of God. You know what that really is saying to me? I heard about Jesus, I tasted Jesus, and He ought to have been crucified. He ought to have died. Oh, no, Brother Tim, I'm just neutral about it. No. If you taste it, and you decide not to eat it in full repentance, and accept Christ and move on, then you're saying, eh, He ought to have been crucified. That's what it says here. They just crucified him to themselves. He deserved it. No. You see, there's no neutral ground here in this people. These people just walked away after taking that taste test and leaving the scene. You see, another thing is spiritual appetite comes with being born again. Peter said, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. You see, once you get saved, you're going to be like a newborn little baby. You're going to be saying, you know, give me milk, give me milk. I mean, part of that crying, yeah, was originally to get some air. But right after that, it was pretty much for another fact. 
I want to eat. I want to eat, and I don't know how to talk yet. I don't know the words yet, so here's what I want to eat means. Ah! That's translated, I want to eat, okay? Without need knowing how to say the words for it. I'm hungry. I need to eat something. You know, I was sharing with a person a while back. They were sharing with me their burden over a particular relative that just they couldn't convince to really get into church and couldn't get him to read their Bible and pray and hang around Christian people. They were just, they said, I'm just frustrated. I mean, I'm going no place. And I told that person, I said, and you're not going to be able to till that person gets hungry. And once they get hungry, Katie barred the door and stand away and let them come because they're going to be hungry. But you, you, you're trying to make somebody become hungry that's not hungry. You're trying to put food in front of somebody who's not hungry. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't keep trying and we keep doing that. I wasn't trying to tell him that. It, it's kind of like Rebecca has this scent that she was, had, was going off in the house and, you know, I think the name of it was birthday cake or something. It smelled just like strawberry cupcakes in the oven, coming out of the oven. I mean, that's, that's what it, I mean. It said birthday cake, I think, was the scent. It's like, man, what's cooking, you know? It's nothing. It's this artificial scent. And man, you just thought, man, when am I going to see those cupcakes? Man, they're going to taste scrumptious, you know? And I said, you've got to get rid of this scent. <laughs> Why have the scent of cooking dessert in the house with no cooking dessert on the table? I mean, it was driving me crazy. Every day I go, oh, man, somebody's cooking dessert and no dessert. I mean, you know me, worst thing about it, I mean, it's bad enough to fight dessert, but to fight it when it's not there. So that, that, that scent is no longer in the Strickland home. If you would like it, you're welcome to Bart, but it's not going to be with me anymore. Why? But it did help to create an appetite in me for that. Now, you can do that with the lost. You can try to, you know, share them some things. You should elude or protrude that smell of Jesus. They ought to start getting a little hungry, but you still have, it still has to be their own appetite that comes to know the Lord. You see, the third aspect here is spiritual appetite is linked to satisfaction in life. Jesus said at the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now, I don't know about you, but lost people and saved people all really have one desire to be satisfied. They're going after it thinking they're getting satisfied, but every road ends in no satisfaction. We as Christians, if we'll hunger and thirst for the Lord, we're going to get satisfaction. It'll be a hunger that will be filled. See, if you hunger after things of the world, you'll never be filled. It just never can accomplish what it says. You've you got to keep eating more. You've got to keep doing more and doing more and doing more. But when you hunger for the Lord, He's going to satisfy you and me. And that's a great thing. You see, hunger and... And I believe hunger is tied to worship. And a lot of people say, Brother Tim, really what is worship? Is that just what we do up here singing? That's one aspect of it, but that's not the whole deal. I mean, worship is really this hunger and this desire for God. Whether we're singing it, hearing it, worship, it's just that heartfelt desire and admiration for the Lord and, and that worship for Him, you see. We can see that. I, I learned that when I was motocross racing. You know, it's just that desire for something. You know, just, and, and, and different sports aren't wrong, but you can get so into a sport where it becomes your God. It becomes your worship. Matter of fact, there was a T-shirt that was, uh, you could see people wearing back in the 70s and 80s when, when I was racing, and it said, I eat, breathe, and sleep motorcycles. And it's just a T-shirt. Everybody liked it. You know, and really, that's worship. I eat, breathe, and sleep motorcycles. You know, it's just like, that's, that's my... And, and you can see that kind of hunger and worship in sports. Not that sports are wrong, but you can see how that worship portrays. You know, you never hear somebody that's getting ready to go to a NFL game or a sports game, you never hear one guy tell the other guy, are you going to another football game again? You just went last week. You never hear that. But you hear people saying, you're going to church again? What's wrong with you? You didn't get enough last week? No. 
I didn't. I can't ever get enough of Jesus. I'm just so hungry. And you never hear people say, you know, I'm going to go to that NFL game, but I'm going to go in about 25 minutes late after the first quarter. They're so fanatical, they even go early and they call it tailgating. In other words, I'm not going to be late. I'm going to enjoy a little bit even before we get there. It's so good. I just want to fellowship with the football people even ahead of time. I love them so much. You need a little more? <laughs> you know, and, and you know, it's, it's like, and they, and they always say, you know, like, you never hear sports people talking to each other, you know, don't only talk about sports at the sports stadium. Don't talk about sports any other place than the sports stadium because sports talk is only for the sports stadium. It should not be shared with anybody else. <laughs> no, they're talking about it at home and work and in the log. I mean, they're sharing with them everybody. But, you know, that's what people tell about us. That's only for church. Don't care about it with anybody. But they don't do that with what? Because it's worship to them. They love it. They're into it. They hunger for it. They know what worship is. But what about in God's house? It's always different for us. Well, see, Psalms goes on to say, for he has satisfied the thirsty soul, that's God, and the hungry soul, he, that's God, has filled with what is good. Isn't that neat? If I hunger for God, he has promised to fill me and my life with good. I don't know about you, I like good. Don't you? Don't everybody like good? Well, how do I get good? How do I get the good? Well, I'm just going to pray. Well, that's a good start, but it says here that if you, that it's the hungry soul that he fills with good. I got to be hungry for him. Why? So he can fill me with good. You know, spiritual appetite is also, I believe, symbolized in the manger. Symbolized in the manger. Look how many times in Luke, same chapter, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger. Okay, we got it. He's in a manger. Well, let's go to verse 12. And then they said, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Okay, we got that. Verse 16. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the I think it's a little important for us to know that there is some significance to Jesus being in a manger. We know he was born, but here's three repetitive times to let me know as a Bible reader that would let me know, hey, stop. Now Jesus, God's Son, creator of the universe with the Trinity, here he is. He should have been born, in our opinion, in a five-star hotel in a five-star hospital. He's, he's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's, he's God's Son. He should have had the best accommodations possible. Now, I can't fully understand the mind of God, but in my opinion, God had Jesus be born in a place that would have a feeding trough. That's what a manger is. It's a place that you put livestock food. It's a feeding trough is what a manger is. And you can't tell me that that was the symbolism that God of heaven said, listen people, I want you to see that my son was placed in a feeding trough. Feed on him. For your life don't let anything hunger more than the feeding trough child. If you ever forget it, think of the manger. When you ever think of Christmas, think of the manger. It's a feeding trough. Why? So you'll be hungry for my child. And if you're not, get, get that way. Get hungry. So that all you want to eat on is Him. You want Him to fill your life. It's amazing. I left out that part of that verse 7. I'm putting it in now. You know why He was in there? Because there was no room for Him in the end. That's usually our problem. There's just no room for Jesus. That's usually the incident. It's not like we dislike him. We've got something against Christianity. We just don't have enough room for him in our lives. You've got to make room. Why? Because that's why you're not hungry. You've you got to make some room in there. 
in your spiritual stomach, if it's all full of junk, then Jesus is definitely not going to be your hunger. You know, I believe that's why God gave us spiritual appetite before we eat. Why? So that we could understand this one point. What? Because if I was up here preaching saying, spiritual appetite, spiritual, you, would, you may like to say, I, I don't get that. But when all of us know what physical appetite is, and when you're hungry, that's about all that consumes you. I mean, and if you've gone two meals, I mean, for me, a meal and a half, I'm already thinking about it pretty serious. Well, even not, let me be honest. If I miss a snack in between the two meals, I'm thinking pretty serious about food. But if I go miss a meal, miss a snack between a meal, and then miss a meal, you may be talking to me in front of me, but I'm thinking cheeseburger, fries. You know, I'm not, I may not be listening to you fully. Why? Because I'm thinking food, food. I want food. And so you know God gave us appetite so we'd understand this message. You say, I just don't know if I'm hungering for God or not, Brother Tim. Yes, you do. Because you know what appetite does. It just takes over. You just got to have it. And that's how people are. You know, I've heard people in, in such a way almost say like, you know, God's just not important in my life right now. Uh, they may mean I've got children, I've got to finish college, I need to wait to retirement, I've got a lot of things going, I've got some travel. Brother Tim, just right now, maybe this period of year, I, God's just not a priority in my life. I mean, you've talked with people that way. How would you like to go to them and say, well, why don't you make food not a priority in your life for about a year? See how that would go. You couldn't do it. Why? Because that hunger would overtake you and you give up. But see, how can a person say they're not going to have God at all? There's no hunger there. There's no desire. You see, and spiritual appetite can also be hindered. There is hindrances to appetite. And legitimate hindrances. And those same hindrances physically can help us find out why we're not hungering spiritually. And there's really only three. Number one, desserts or snacks. You know, you ha your parents would always tell you, you know, don't eat that right now or you're going to spoil your appetite. Just going to spoil it. Don't be eating all that. Why? Because they wanted you to come to the table hungry for the, mood, for the mood, for the meal they prepared, not for the snacks. So don't eat right before you come eat at the table. Don't, don't desert eat all the time till you're ready to eat the meal. Well, isn't that the case? How appetite decreases due to worldly desserts. Of, and these things aren't wrong, but they're wrong when they're put before God. Money, hobbies, career, relationships, popularity, entertainment, and all these others that we put before God. They're only wrong because you put them before God. You put their priority before God. And guess what happens? you won't be as hungry for God anymore. Why? Because you're full of that. You know, right when you get through with a meal, usually you're not ready for the next meal. Why? You're full. And if you're full of this, these things, then you're not going to be hungry for God. And you don't shake your head thinking, I just don't know why. I know all these Christians, they just can't seem to get enough God. I don't know what it is. Or you say, I know the Lord, but I used to have a hunger, but I don't anymore. Well, maybe this has filled your life in such a way that your spiritual stomach is full of these things that you've put before God. Now, the second thing is disease. When you're sick, your appetite, when you're real sick, usually your appetite goes away and you're not as hungry. It's the only time, mark it down, in our marriage that Rebecca will say, Tim, you really need to eat a little something. Instead of, Tim, it's time to back away from the table. You know, three helpings is enough. You know, but she has to tell me that when I'm real sick is you need to eat a little something, a cracker, a, a little bit of broth. Put something in you. Why? Because when your body has disease, there's something that goes on to say we're not hungry right now. Boy, why did God make the body like that for this illustration? Because when you've got some sin in your life, that sin disease you know, that you're hanging on to, you'll fail to, and you fail to confess it, you fail to get it right with God, whether it's pride, 
lust, forgiveness, immorality, jealousy, whatever the case may be, if you're hanging on to that, you can hold on to your blue in the face and you're not going to get hungry. Why? Because that sin disease is just going to, and people have to, you say, I guess I'll go to church. I guess I'll read my Bible. Oh, but I don't want to. I'm just forcing myself. Well, there you go. You may want to look in your life and see if maybe one of these sins you're holding on, just confess it, get it right with God, and praise the Lord, appetite comes back. Isn't it? Isn't that one of the greatest signs you're getting well? It's like, you know, you can ask doctors. Man, my appetite's coming back. Man, you're on the way back. Man, it's, you're, you're getting healed. And that's a good sign that you're getting that spiritual healing and you're getting right with God. And death. Hate to tell you this, but there's never been a person in a coffin raise up and say, give me a Big Mac. At the time of death, hunger ceases in the physical life. It ceases. And is it any surprise that the spiritually dead, that's the people that have never come to know Christ truly in salvation, have no hunger for God? They have no hunger. No legitimate hunger for God. They may come to the spiritual restaurant, they may take part in the spiritual restaurant, but they, they don't really have a, a, a hunger for God. And so the spiritually dead are never going to... Because, you know, that's, that's the analogy that Jesus gave to Nicodemus. When he told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Je Nicodemus wanted to get saved. He wanted to come to the, he wanted to know how to get to heaven. And Jesus said, you must be born again. Well, Nicodemus didn't get it. He said, well, how do I go back up in my mother's womb? I, 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 don't, I don't know how to do that. He said, Jesus was trying to give the analogy. No, that's not what I'm talking about. You see, we were all born physically, but at the moment of conception, we were all dead spiritually. When you came out of the womb, you were dead. I was dead spiritually. I may have done some moral things. I may have done some religious things. I may have read my Bible, but I was born dead spiritually. So now Jesus is trying to talk about Nicodemus saying, you need a second birth. Because if you don't, you're going to die dead spiritually and you see you'll go to hell. So you need a spiritual birth. And then once you can get that spiritual birth, then you can hunger after God. Because now you'll be born again. And your life is given spiritual birth. You know, some people say, you know, Jesus, did he really give a plan of salvation? I know he said, come and follow me, but we always give a plan of salvation. You know, did Jesus ever give a plan of salvation? I, th I think there was a similar, more or less plan of salvation in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, he wasn't saying blessed are you if you're poor, which is okay to be poor, but he wasn't saying that because he didn't say blessed are the poor. He said blessed are the poor in spirit. And what he was saying was the first step in being happy is to realize that in and of yourself, apart from God, you are dead as a hammer spiritually. He said, Brother Tim, you don't understand. I've done some moral things and I've given deal. And I've given. No, before we come to know Christ, even our best act of righteousness, the Bible says, is as filthy rags. Jesus is saying the first step to being happy is to realize that you and I are bankrupt, zero money in our spiritual bank. Matter of fact, this word that Jesus chose for poor, it just, I mean, there's all these levels of poor. He chose the very bottom one, which meant this poor is so poor that you're begging for food, and if you don't get it, you won't eat. That's how poor this is. I don't think anybody's that poor in this room. That, that means when you finish this deal, you're going to go out in the corner and beg for food, and if somebody doesn't give it to you, you don't eat because you don't have any money. You don't have any place to live. You're that destitute. Jesus said, that's the key is realizing spiritually you need God desperately because you're spiritually bankrupt, you're poor, and you need some spiritual help. And that's why he's saying you really need a Savior now. A lot of people were trying to convince they need a Savior. and You need a Savior. You need a Savior. You know what they're really saying? No, I don't. No, I don't. No, I don't. And Jesus said, look at your spiritual bank account, and if you really will be honest, you're zero. 
And if you think any of that good works counts to your spiritual bank account, you're wrong. Only Jesus gives me anything in my spiritual bank account. And then he said, blessed are they that mourn. What was he saying? You need to have godly sorrow over your sin. Man, my sin is what nailed Jesus to the tree. I mean, that, that, that's why he died. Yeah, he, 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 of his own, he gave his life, but it was my sin that, that caused him to go to the cross. That's what he was paying for. And then it says, blessed are the gentle. And this word means under control. That's, we use it for horses. If you've got a gentle horse, that means it's a horse under control. You can get on him and he'll allow you to control him. He's a gentle horse. And, and that's what it meant there. You're, you're ready to give control to God. So you see the progression? One, without, I, I am so lost and destitute without God. My spiritual bank account has zero, no matter how moral I say I am. I'm spiritually bankrupt. I need a Savior. I am so sorry over my sin. God, please forgive me. I need you as a Savior. And I'm godly sorrow. I have godly sorrow over that sin. Now, God, please take control of this life. You know what Jesus said next? Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now I've got a spiritual appetite. I never guessed I'd have a spiritual appetite. As a kid, I was raised in church, and praise God, my parents took me to church. But... I mean, sometimes it's like you've got to go to church, you know, and I thought, man, having to go to church all the time, I thought, man, just think, some people are pastors, and they have to go all the time. <laughs> but once you get a hunger, then you know what it's all about. You don't have to be twisted your arm to go because, you know, this is good stuff. Because I tasted, and I saw that the Lord was good. And what I thought wasn't going to be any good was good because God made it good. You know, many of you, you go to restaurants and you have the waiter that comes to you and, you know, the waiter, he's either going to give you a description of the specials, you know, he's going to say, okay, today we're offering this and, and whatever. He's going to go through all the whole special. Or he, he's going to answer your questions about a particular, hey, what about this right here? What's, and he's going to give you a description about that particular item on the menu. Well, you know, the waiter comes over to you and, you know, it's his job to really get this thing right and do the best he can at describing this great food. So he may say, you know, we, we're serving succulent lobster grilled over an open fire with drawn butter that'll drip every time you put it in for another morsel of that tasty, delicious, succulent lobster with a baked potato loaded with butter and cheese and sour cream and, and all of that. And, and we serve a delicious mouth-watering ribeye steak with our homemade sauce that just drips over the side. And it's so tender, you could just eat it. Y'all get here. Well, yeah. <laughs> Phillips chicken sure going to sell good today. And you just... <laughs> I get a little back, uh, little back feet on that. Uh, and, and so you take that little fork and it just goes, you don't even need a knife, it's so tender. And, and we also sell this chocolate molten cake. And yeah, <laughs> she's ready to go to Strickland's restaurant. And it's, it's coated with white chocolate all over that's on the hot cake, but it makes a crispy, little coating of white chocolate. And then we serve this big helping of bluebell ice cream right there in the middle. We take it and we coat it with some other chocolate syrup and then just a little bit. <laughs> uh, you go ahead and put up with me. And, and you put that chocolate syrup on there, a little bit of caramel right there on the side, and you would love that. it just melt in your mouth. So you listen to all that. And then you tell the waiter, Amen, brother! That was the best restaurant menu sermon I think I've ever heard. You did good. You did great analogies. And even myself, as I listen to that, and you understand, I have a degree in MA. What is MA? It's menu analysis. I'm certified from the menu analysis Biblical board. 
And I heard that, that sermon on that food, and it, it, that, that was a good message. And even when I came in, your people greeted me so well at the restaurant door. And when we came in, they just greeted me so well. And, and, and even your music in the restaurant was just lovely. I just enjoyed hearing it while I waited. And your ambiance and your lighting was just fantastic. And your sermon on the menu was right on target. Praise the Lord, we're leaving. And you say, well, where are you going? Well, we're going home. Or we may even go by another restaurant and hear another message on menus. Yours was so good. But you're not staying to eat? No. We didn't come here to eat. We just came here to hear the message and get greeted at the door at your restaurant and the ambiance and the music, and now we're leaving. And the man would say, look, our greeters in the door had a purpose. And our music had a purpose. And our menu explanation had a purpose. It was so that you would sit down and eat a great meal and it would benefit you and change you and satisfy you. But it won't do any good from just sitting and listening. That's all right. This is what we do every week. We go from restaurant to restaurant to hear the best explanation of menus. And yours was just one of the best. You say, that is so crazy. That goes on in churches all across America. And we wonder why people's hearts and minds and lives are changed when Jesus and God said, I put him in a manger to remind you at Christmas and all year long, eat. You'll never be changed from just listening. And you don't get any credit, spiritual credit, from being at the restaurant. That's not going to satisfy you. Matter of fact, when you eat that great succulent meal, guess what? You're going to eat it and say, I wonder if they're open tomorrow. <laughs> but you just had that meal today. I know when I'd go out to eat with Brother Tim and Brother Joe and we go out to eat, I, they'd make the comment sometime, man, we ate so much, I don't even think I will be hungry for dinner. I go home to Rebecca, I said, I don't get that. <laughs> I've never eaten any meal that I'm not hungry. You know. But you know, isn't that what it is? When you eat and it's food you really like, it just makes you hungry for more. And why some people will die and go to hell because they just took a taste of Jesus and never took Him in so they could get the hunger for more Jesus and take Him in and more Jesus and hunger and hunger and hunger. But you know what? No matter how long we've been saved, there's times in our spiritual life that our hunger goes down. I don't care how spiritual you are, how many degrees you have, how much theology you have, how much you read your Bible. There are times in our spiritual life that our hunger starts to wane. And it's easy to answer this question. Are you saved? Yes. Do you love God? Yes. Are you right with God? Yes. But it's a different way to answer this question. How's your spiritual appetite? And then you've got to really analyze yourself. You know what? You've got to answer one or several ways. One, you may have to answer this way. You say, you know, Brother Tim, I got saved and I, I know what spiritual appetite is and right now it's not what I think it really ought to be. Now, I'm really not hungering after things of God. I've I got some other priorities in my life right now and, or I've got some other sin in my life that's it's just not where it should be. And it needs to be back to where it is. Something's wrong. Or you're, you're out there saying, you know, I don't know if I've even ever had a spiritual appetite. I don't know what it is to long to come to God's house, to long to look at His Word, to long to be around God's people. I, I don't know if I've ever had that. Well, until you're born again, then you will get that spiritual appetite. You'll hunger the things of God, but you've got to taste it. But once you taste it, then you eat. So some this morning, that's what hinders you. Maybe you haven't ever fully taken Jesus from the manger and fed on Him in your heart and made it real in your life to where a change happens in you that now 
You're like all those other fanatical Christians. You're just hungry. And you won't call it fanatical to eat three times a day. And you won't call it fanatical many times to be around God's people more often or read more often or study more often. Why? Because you're hungry and nothing seems to completely satisfy you. You just want more and more and more and more. God had His Son born in a manger. To be our constant reminder, I believe, is are you putting my Son as your number one appetite quencher? If not, make adjustments today. If it's priorities, change them. You don't have to pay penance. Guess what? When you change them like that, the appetite comes back. If it's sin, hey, just like when you were sick and you got it confessed and you got well, boom, the appetite comes back. You don't have to pay penance and be miserable for another week. Boom, the appetite. Walk in freedom and liberty. And if it's not coming to the Lord, don't let Satan keep condemning you. Come to know the Lord. Receive it. Get the appetite and receive all the good things from God and move on and have a revival. So we ask, how is your spiritual appetite? With every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet, at this time we have our...